Good afternoon. Our topics today are uniform circular motion and universal gravitational law. So to talk about uniform circular motion, if you kind of close your eyes and review starting from the morning when you wake up and how many going around you have to do. So you walk around and you have to drive around um, you know, so you, know, you basically cannot avoid going around. So that's the very common motion we are there. Now, if you are like me, actually like to go out and these days are very crisp outside at night. It's a beautiful sky. You look up to the sky and you see stars and moon, uh, you know, these couple of days happen to be full moon. So it's very beautiful. So you realize, yeah, the sunrise and going on one side and drop to the other side. The moon does the same thing, coming up and going down, and all of the stars seemingly doing the same thing. So that is the same for the ancients. So people have been used to this. The thing, of course, is come to some of us will begin to think, what causes the things go around? It feels like everything is going around. And more precisely, we are going around the sun and the moon goes around us. So what causes all these going around motions? To really understand that, um, let's see, we go to the laws, right? So obviously at this point, Newton's laws, and that's where we want to go. So, um, so there again, just showing you uh, a mass can be going around. So whether it's you walking around or a car driving around um, or uh, earth going around the sun or the moon goes around the earth. So uniform motion simply means, well, you do not change the rate of the motion, but you change the direction, right? So what causes it, okay? So let's see, we go to the laws. Um, imagine yourself floating in space. There's nothing you can push this arm and there's nothing can push this on you. In that situation, you see you're alone, you're isolated, you cannot possibly interact with anything else because nothing else is around. And therefore, logically, if you think carefully, then you realize, okay, I am going to move to one direction with the same rate forever. It, it's, it's like you have a tendency to keep that same motion forever. And therefore, this is the first law, which is a law of inertia, which is tendency. You can't do anything because you're not interacting with anything else. So come to the mechanical sense. Since you cannot push on anything else and nothing else can push on you and therefore the force exerted on you or you can exert it onto anything else is zero, which means acceleration is zero. So that's mechanically speaking. So the next question is, what if I actually have something to push up or something actually come to interacting with me. So let's say, imagine this is you, the red ball, I hope you can see, and you're going forward. So then um, let's say you're going to a concert and you're moving at a slower pace. And then another friend comes and saying, you're too slow, you're going to miss the beginning. So then you speed up. So it's kind of like an interaction, right, in daily life. But the interaction, mechanically speaking, is actually described by force, which means mechanically, if you're driving the car, you actually press your accelerator a little bit and therefore you speed up because you are actually having a non-balanced force, so you go faster. Now, what would be the scenario on the other side you're moving towards the concert, your friend comes back from opposite direction telling you, you know what, the musicians are not even here, the flight is canceled for whatever reason, 
So the pain is delayed to tomorrow night. There's no meaning to go. So you will get into action is a daily encounter, but mechanically speaking, is a force exerted opposite to your motion. And therefore you would actually slow down or decelerate because you're going to reverse direction. So that's equivalent to when you're driving, you put a foot onto the brake, right? So now you, you slow down. So in both of those examples, all right, so that's uh, on the screen is the first example, and there is the second example. So in both these uh, examples, what happens is the force is either going with your motion or opposite to your motion. They're parallel or anti-parallel. So your question is, um, okay, so what happens if a force comes along sideways, okay? So let's see if that's the center stage where you are, is, is the center stage, music is played, and I am actually uh, trying to find a seat, let's see. But everywhere is filled with people. So I would just walk, but, but you know, my purpose is to listen to music and watch on you. So the, the attraction is really at where you are, it's the center stage. So that is, mechanically speaking, there's an interaction, and that in interaction seems to, here, I'm trying to go forward, but the traction, the force, is pulling me on the side. And so if I'm going forward, the strength is pulling me, I got to move a little bit this way. But when I am moving, the strength is pulling me in again. It's like, you know, I naturally have to walk around. And so that would be, the motion, as you can see here, going around, causes a circular motion. And if the strength is pulling towards the center all the time, then that interaction is always perpendicular to where you want to go. So you are moving forward, but the strength is pulling you to this way, attraction, interaction, force is pointing to this way, and therefore, it cannot be possibly result in acceleration or a deceleration. So it doesn't change your rate of motion. However, it changes your direction constantly. And that's how you work out a circular motion, right? So now, your next question would be, okay, so here's all the mystery, right? Because when ancients look up the sky we see things just ordinarily going around but today we know that's not true all the big planets or anything possess, possess mass would have to be following certain laws otherwise because they, they don't have a will all right these are dead you know, entities so why are the planets going around and therefore logically you think well the logic is there got to be a force causing this, these objects go around so they don't go straight forward. And that's our question. Let's look at the Earth and going around the sun. But seemingly, we don't find any ties, physical ties, tangible, measurable ties. We don't see anything. And it took mankind, you know, eons of time to figure out there got to be a force, and that is because Newton's law said so. And once we actually fool that, now things become, you know, making sense. Because here you are. If I am the sun, and here is the earth. So here you are. So the string is actually holding the earth going around. But then, since we don't have the tie, so we have to think, what would be the nature of that force? Turns out, so we found all of the things on the mass, right? They got to attract to each other. And that comes to, all right, so here we are. Imagine, if the sun did not have mass, we wouldn't be affected. If we didn't have mass, it wouldn't be affected. And therefore, the force attracting two point masses towards each other got to be directly proportional to both masses. 
So we put them upstairs and, you know, new numerators. And then we said the force has to be inversely proportional distance. That makes sense. Even in human communication, if you have a roommate, you talk every day, that's very close. And imagine someday you graduate and you go apart and you are actually in two different cities, yeah, you might text each other, you might call each other over the weekend, but you know, your, your interaction would be sort of less. And imagine someday actually one of you travel to the moon. Well, you, you need some special devices to actually keep contact. And therefore your, your, in, your interaction is going to be less. And therefore it makes really the sense if it's close, the force got to be stronger, move away. The force is going to be smaller and yet even more smaller. That makes sense. But then you said, okay, it's an inverse proportional to the distance. And why is that? Okay, so um, I want you to, wait, I'm just grab a piece of paper, right? So here you are. If you wanted to, you can follow me on this uh, exercise, okay? So here is a piece of paper I have. Now I'm going to fold it into half and a half, all right? And then I'm going to tear it apart. So I'm creating two pieces of equal sized paper, as you can see. Now I put one piece on the table and the other one I'm going to fold it. Fold it once. So you know the area already reduced to just one half. And I fold it once again. So here you are, you got, I fold it to a quarter. So the area is only one quarter of the original piece of paper, but then the thickness actually is four times. So what happens, let's do this uh, exercise, right? So I'm gonna hold this piece at arm's length. And I'm gonna hold the other piece actually somewhere in between and adjustable. So I'm gonna close one eye to look at this whole thing just by one eye. And I'll say, so I'm gonna move this until uh, just this at one point, the two pieces to my eye look the same size. So they're overlapping. I no longer can see the further piece of paper. And if you look at the distance of the two pieces to my eye, what do you think? Gave the rough estimation? So you can turn to your friend, ask them. And if you do it right, okay? So it's going to show you the distance between the closer piece of paper to my eye is one half of the distance from the further piece of paper to my eye. Therefore you say, okay, so the area, okay, isn't that I'm going further, becomes smaller, but it actually is a squared going away. And that, that is the inverse square law. So if I do this, let's see if I turn around, so you can see I form two uh, circles around me. If I paint it up and down everywhere, I think you can, you know where I'm leading to, right? So around my eye, I have one sphere and I have another sphere. And the bigger sphere is doubled in radius than the, the smaller sphere. But the surface area isn't just doubled, it's actually four times as large as the surface area of the smaller sphere. But that smaller sphere has a four times of the thickness. So now if you try to tear this off, you would have to exert four times of force as you're trying to pull that off. So what that says, that says this law inversely proportional to, to the distance squared simply reflect our universe is a three-dimensional space. We live in a three-dimensional space. If 
we lived in a two-dimensional flat land, or if we lived in a four-dimensional space, then this law would have different shape. So, and, and this law, this shape will stay with us because it's simply our geometry. And that's going to show up when you further go in with electricity. Okay, so you're going to say electric force takes exactly the same shape. And because it's the three dimensional space we live in. So at this point, we say, okay, well, we like to have equations. We don't want to have just a proportion. We figure out if there's nothing else matters. So, you know, has come up, we add in a coefficient and we call universal gravitational constant, which make the equation equal, you know, make, make it an equation. And this law, voila, is universal, applies to all of the mass objects. So any two mass object, objects, me and you, we are attracted to each other. Me and the tree out the window, attracted to each other. We don't really feel those attractions because it's awfully, awfully weak. Just look at the gravitational constant. It's a 6.67 .6 times 10 to the negative 11th power. It is very weak. So weak. Think about it. It takes such a humongous Earth beneath me to keep me on the surface of Earth. And yet, I am not flat like a piece of paper. I still have my height. The trees still grow that tall. And you know, that will come a lot. It's because the internal we have electric force actually counterbalancing that. So the bottom line is I can still jump. Okay? Although I cannot fly away, but I can still jump. And it takes such a humongous mass beneath me just to keep me on the surface here. And that's not too strong as you walk. So gravitational force is absolutely a weak force. But then on the other side, you look up to the sky, you see, well, all these masses going around. They're so huge in masses scattered all over in the space in our universe. And why are they staying together? Because they're attracted to each other, right? So now the next question, right, is, okay, and go by this logic, your question would be, huh, that's interesting. If all the masses are attracted to one another, how come they don't actually collapse, right? So why doesn't Earth just uh, go to the sun right here? Why doesn't Earth just uh, collapse into the sun? So that tells you that really, to me, it answers the question why everything goes around. The only way the Earth can keep itself from crashing into the sun is keep moving in a circle, okay? So here I have this thing. On this end, I have a 50 grams of mass hanging there and going through a fishing line, going through the other glass tube on the other side. I have a red ball, I hope you can see. And the red ball is not so massive. And so if I let it go, here we go. It will be pulled by the force. So this is attractive force between the two. So the only way to keep this uh, ball not to actually fall to, you know, the ball is like Earth right now, not to fall into the sun is by having to move around. As you can see right now, is moving around. And so it can balance out because it requires certain force. And if all that weight of the mass down there through the rope, through the fishing line, serves as centripetal force, then the ball actually goes around, but not to fall to the center. If I stop, as you can see, it's going to speed up and shoo, to the center, right? So we will be burned instantly. Anyway, uh, so, um, so that's why things would have to be actually go around. Furthermore, um, 
Earth mass is definite. The sun's mass is definite. So at a certain distance or whatever distance you have, then the, the actually any planet does not have a wheel can determine how fast you want to go, which means we can't change, okay? So we have 365 days as a year, and you know that's uh, the time, and then we go around, you know, just once the conference, so that gave you a definite speed. Um, if we want to change that, then we had to change the, the radius, okay, which is how far the Earth is from the sun. So if I moved it in, I guess you can see, right, clearly it speeds up. So uh, any planet closer to, if we were closer to the sun, we would have a shorter year. But at our current time, we have 365 days. And if we go away further from the sun, we would slow down. We wouldn't really need to go that fast. Our year would be actually longer. So um, that's the uh, universal gravitational law and why circular motion plays such an important role. And all of these is because Newton's laws. Okay, so we need to have a force to change the velocity of the motion, which includes both rate and direction. And in terms of uniform circular motion, there is no tangential acceleration. It's only changing the direction. And because direction is forever towards the center, so it's a center-seeking force, and therefore the result is a center-seeking acceleration, which is centripetal force, causes centripetal acceleration, that causes or keeps everything going around. I hope that kind of like ties everything together, okay? Why uniform circular motion is important. And this is the first natural force you actually encounter and keep going you will get to the second, uh, hopefully someday, third and the fourth. Have a good day. Thank you.